Hello, real estate investors. Sam Hack here to talk to you about a very frequently asked about tax topic in real estate, the real estate professional status. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell below to stay up to date with our videos. We appreciate all the engagement, comments, and especially getting to 500 subscribers. We'll see you at 1,000. To start, the real estate professional status is a designation granted to taxpayers if they pass certain tests. We'll get into those tests in just a little bit. If a taxpayer passes those tests and qualifies as a real estate professional, they will receive some pretty cool tax benefits. This not only means that the real estate professional status is a highly sought after designation, but it also means that it's a highly litigated and audited status. So we need to make sure we understand how it all works and make sure to get it right. Please go back and watch my previous video from about two weeks ago that was uploaded about the tax benefits of investing in real estate so you have a better idea what we're going to talk about in this video. Also, before you implement any tax strategies, especially more creative ones or more specific designations like the real estate professional status, make sure to run them by your CPA or tax professional so they can confirm and approve your plans. So let's talk a little bit about the background of the real estate professional status, also known as section 469 of the US tax code. So back before 1986, doctors and other high income individuals were investing in real estate either by buying their own rentals or by buying in a syndication. They were then using the amazing tax benefits of investing in rental real estate, again, check out my tax video about this, to offset their very high W-2 income. Other people started to catch on to this tax strategy that they were using, which was just investing in real estate, and were getting pretty mad that doctors were paying some of the lowest taxes in the entire country and not doing much to achieve this due to how passive real estate is. In fact, the Department of Treasury found that pre-1986, of those people making over $250,000 a year in gross income, 11% of those people paid less than 5% in taxes, and 21% of those people paid less than 10% in taxes. Enter the US Tax Code, Section 469. Section 469 created two types of income, passive income and non-passive income or active income. Every dollar that you earn is gonna fall into either the passive income or non-passive income bucket. Passive income is earnings from a rental property, a limited partnership, or other business in which a person is not actively involved. Non-passive income, on the other hand, or active income, includes any active income, such as W-2 wages, business income, or investment income. Make sure you understand the difference between investment income and the passive income we're gonna be getting from real estate. Even though real estate's an investment, there's a difference between investment income in that active category. This is portfolio income, interest, guaranteed payments from real estate syndications, or um, interest on like your bank accounts. If the income is passive income and creates a loss, such as depreciation in real estate, after 1986, you could no longer claim that loss against your non-passive income. The whole idea is that if you are just providing capital to an investment, you should not be getting such great tax benefits if you're not really doing anything material in the running of that business. By business, I mean real estate investments as well because real estate, rental real estate is a business. The whole change to the tax code surrounds the idea of write-offs or deductions that cost you money it could be actual money or just costing you money on paper while running a business. When we take a deduction, we're subtracting that from our total taxable income for the year, which will then give us a lower effective income that will be taxed. The percentage we owe may still be the same, however, it's gonna be uh, a, the same percentage on a lower amount, or we may even end up in a lower tax bracket if we get enough deductions. In the case of real estate, there are lots and lots of losses that can be deducted. Again, I talked about this on my last tax video, so please go back and check that out. It will make a lot more sense if you watch that video first. The main deduction that we're gonna talk about in this video, or at least think about, is the depreciation deduction. This is a huge benefit in rental real estate. Let me parse out how income is designated as passive or non-passive a little bit better for you. If you invest in a business, like a syndication that's investing in real estate, without being actively involved, making decisions, etc that income from the company that's paid back to you as an owner or investor is considered passive income. Rental real estate is considered a business. There's a product, the house or condo that you might be renting, customers, your tenants, and income, the rents. 
Now, passive rental losses for those doctors pre-1986 could immediately offset their active W-2 income from their high-paying medical jobs. However, after 1986, their passive losses from the depreciation of their rental real estate could no longer offset their non-passive income. The tax loophole that they were using was effectively closed. But like all great regulations, there are externalities. So once that loophole was closed, people who worked full-time in real estate started to complain because they were unable to depreciate their assets when other professionals in other industries could depreciate their equipment like machines in the manufacturing sector or medical equipment for doctors. So in 1994, the IRS amended section 469 to allow for real estate investors to deduct passive losses from their active income, but only if they passed some certain tests to prove they were really real estate professionals and not doctors in disguise again. All in all, the reason that we wanna qualify as a real estate professional and materially participate in our rentals is to go pre-1986 and get those amazing tax benefits of deducting our passive losses from our active income. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty here. So there are three main types or three categories that the IRS designates real estate investors as. The first one is gonna be you're a passive investor. And this is really the default. The IRS is gonna make you a passive investor unless you go ahead and check a different box. To qualify as a passive investor, you're basically just an investor only and you don't make any decisions about the property. This means you can only deduct passive losses against passive or rental income. Basically, if you're in this category as a passive investor, you're a doctor that is now post-1986. The next category that the IRS designates real estate investors as is an active investor. And to qualify as an active investor, you basically just need to make some decisions about your properties. Everyone should at least be able to qualify as an active investor if you're a real estate investor at all, because it's so easy. All you have to do is make decisions. You can even have a property manager. As an active investor, you can deduct up to $25,000 a year in passive losses against your active income. However, this stops when you start making over $150,000 a year in adjusted gross income. However, keep tracking those deductions and expenses because for active status, if you don't use all of your write-offs or losses because your losses actually exceed your rental income, they can be carried over for future use in a passive loss bucket. This passive loss bucket means that you can use these passive losses against income on the sale of any of your properties in the future after depreciation recapture. Please don't let your CPA tell you that because you're over $150,000 a year in adjusted gross income, that passive losses won't help you. They can always be used in the future, so just make sure to track them regardless. Okay, so on to our third designation, what you've all been waiting for, the real estate professional status. To qualify as a real estate professional, there are two main tests. Number one, you need to spend at least 750 hours per year in a real property trade or business. So this would mean about on average 14 hours a week or two hours per day on real estate activities such as being a realtor, house flipping, being a contractor, etc. The second part of this test number one is that it must be real property trades or businesses in which you materially participate. And what that means is if you materially participate, it means you must own 5% or more of the company. And so if you're like a realtor like me or a contractor, you'll wanna use an S Corp or LLC for pass-through income. This will not work if you're just working for a real estate related business and you don't own any of it. So don't be fooled here. Test number two, to qualify as a real estate professional is that you must spend at least half of your total working time in a real property trade or business. So this means you must spend more time in a real property trade or business than in anything else, AKA your full-time job as a doctor. Remember 1986? The 11 types of real property trades or businesses are real property development, redevelopment, construction, reconstruction, acquisition, conversion, rental, operation, management, leasing, or brokerage. 
So here I'm gonna give you the classic scenario, which a lot of you will probably fall into and what I fall into as well. You're a real estate agent or broker and you do 750 hours via your work as a real estate agent per year and then you're dumping a lot of your commissions into buying rentals. So come tax season, you'll need to prove that you materially participate in the rentals in order to be able to deduct your passive losses from your active income, or like in my case, sales commissions. For material participation, you must meet one of these tests. There are actually seven tests, but these three that I'm gonna explain are just the most relevant. Number one, and remember, you only have to meet one of these tests. You could spend at least 500 hours on the activity in one year, like this is your rental activity. Number two, you could basically do everything. And it's hard to basically do everything. This means like you don't outsource everything. You're plunging toilets and fixing leaky sinks, etc. And number three, you participate in that activity for at least 100 hours in a year and nobody participates more than you do. And this one is pretty irrelevant as well because if you had partners in this business, um, say you invested uh, with your friend in a rental property, well, your friend is gonna to wanna to use this um, rule and so he's gonna put in 101 hours and then you're gonna put in 102 and then he's gonna put in 103 and four and so you're basically just gonna keep climbing up that ladder until this rule becomes irrelevant and you're probably gonna to wanna to just end up in that 500 hour category. This rule also is a little relevant because you don't have the time logs from other people and in an audit, you'd have to produce their time logs to basically show you've done uh, 100 hours and more than everyone else involved in the rental. A couple caveats to the material participation test is that as long as one spouse hits the real estate professional status, both spouses can actually pitch in to hit the material participation hours, like with one spouse doing 100 hours and the other doing 400, or it could be more equal. This does not mean that spouses may combine their hours to hit the real estate professional test of 750 hours, only the material participation hours test. The material participation test treats every rental property as its own rental activity, so you'd normally have to spend 500 hours on each property unless you use the 9G election, ask your CPA about this, which allows you to aggregate all of your rental activities into one. Once you make that 9G grouping election, you can start putting your passive losses together and start deducting them from your non-passive income if you are qualifying as a real estate professional. Another caveat to this is that if a short-term rental is rented on average for seven days or less, your deductible losses are normally limited to zero. However, if you can prove that you materially participate in the rentals, your losses will be deductible from non-passive income, regardless of failing the seven day rule because they become business losses. Okay, so here are a few tips that I've learned about qualifying as a real estate professional. The number one tip for qualifying as a real estate professional and enjoying these great tax benefits is documentation. Document everything. Substantiate everything. Do not skip out on this. Make sure it's credible, log everything, and fudge nothing. Basically, just act like you're going to be audited on a daily basis, or at least every single year. Expect that to happen. Don't create time logs once you end up under audit. Make them today and make sure they're very detailed. Don't generalize because you will regret it during an audit. You need to make sure you are very credible in all ways because in tax court, they'll audit each and everything you log on your time log. If your time logs show that you took an hour to just write an email or make out a check to someone, you will lose credibility and pretty much certainly lose that tax case. You'll also wanna really make sure that your credit card statements are also matching your time logs because uh, in tax court, they're gonna start cross-referencing credit card statements with time logs. Make sure you're not five states away on a family reunion and logging that you're working on your rental properties. The major tip for understanding material participation is that the things that you're logging in your time logs, if they are not affecting the day-to-day -day operations of your rentals, then the hours logged are probably not gonna count as material participation in the eyes of the IRS or tax court. Material participation hours or activities are gonna include things like purchasing supplies 
for improvements or fixes on your rentals, uh, doing inspections of the property, responding to tenant complaints and inquiries, collecting deposits and rents, evicting tenants, advertising, maintaining a website or listings for your units, showing the property to prospective renters, taking tenant applications, processing them, screening tenants, preparing and negotiating leases, cleaning and doing repairs on your units, and doing improvements yourself or coordinating improvements on your units. Hours or activities that you may think qualify as material participation, but don't, and listen carefully to these, are education and research time. Reading books about real estate, taking online courses, going to seminars, they're not gonna count. There's also something called investor level hours, which is researching new properties, going like surfing Zillow, realtor.com, et cetera. Um, anything in, a, in an investor capacity, um, or even just supervising your property manager and logging those hours, those are not gonna count as material participation. Again, if the activities you're performing do not affect the day-to-day -day operations of your rentals, AKA like your rentals are gonna fall apart without them, these are not gonna qualify as material participation hours. A couple myths about qualifying for the real estate professional status. The first of which is that you could invest out of state and have property managers on all your properties and still qualify. This isn't really gonna work realistically because yes, you can coordinate certain fixes and coordinate with your property managers to uh, count as material participation hours, but it's gonna be really hard. You're gonna need a really large portfolio to do this. So unless you have double digits plus units, um, this one's probably not gonna work for you. Another myth about the real estate professional status is that your real estate professional hours can carry over from year to year. And this is just wrong. You actually have to meet the real estate professional hours tests every year, 750 per year. Next, if you have passive losses in your passive losses bucket from a year you don't have a real estate professional certification, then just because the next year you do qualify as a real estate professional means those passive losses can be recharacterized. And again, the answer to this is no, because only passive losses from a year you qualify will be deductible from non-passive income. Lastly, a misconception is that you go and get your real estate license and you're gonna qualify as a real estate professional. And the answer to this is no. You must meet those tests, the 750 hour per year test, and the more than half your time in a real property trade or business. However, you could combine your hours as an agent doing, let's say, 700 hours of transactions as a broker, a real estate agent, and then materially participate in your rentals for 50 hours, and then you would meet all the tests and qualify as a real estate professional. Okay, guys, wow, that was a big episode. Uh, I hope it answered a lot of questions that you have about the real estate professional status. If you work in real estate, make sure you're shooting for that real estate professional status. And if you're not, at least try to land in that active investor category and enjoy some of those amazing tax benefits of investing in real estate. Just remember that rent to retirement is here to not only help you invest in real estate, but then to maximize the benefits of real estate over time. Real estate just keeps getting better and better the more you learn about it. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell below. Follow me on Instagram at Sam H Real Estate. And for more information about rent to retirement or anything that we do, please see the contact info in the outro. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.